Okay, it's uh, 8 o'clock. I think it's probably time for us to get our session going if we're going to try to keep to our schedule. So, uh, welcome, good morning, and welcome to this union session um, on Mount St. Helens uh, at 40 years uh, old. Uh, talk about the legacies, uh, scientific and societal legacies. So, the session's convened to explore the scientific and societal legacies of the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. My name is John Major, and I'm at the USGS Cascades Volcano Observatory. Uh, my co-conveners are Cynthia Gardner, also at the USGS Cascades Volcano Observatory, and Claire Horwell from Durham University. Uh, the lens of time clarifies legacies of prominent events. And as we embark on our commemoration of the 40th anniversary of the renowned 18 May 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens, one of the 20th century's greatest geophysical events, uh, the clarity of its impact on science and society has become sharper. For millions, the eruption was an awe-inspiring event that captivated attention and curiosity for days to weeks. But for others, events of that fateful morning uh, still affect lives and livelihoods. The eruption was a pivotal event in many scientific disciplines, including volcanology, geophysics, hydrology, geomorphology, ecology, forestry, atmospheric sciences, and health sciences, just to name a few. Suddenly, scientists grasped that volcanoes can abruptly collapse in gigantic landslides, that rapidly depressurized magma can generate an energetic pyroclastic density current that sweeps broadly across rugged landscape and within minutes can remove, raise, and scorch mature stands of forest across hundreds of square kilometers, that both swift melting of snow and ice on a volcano and dewatering of a massive landslide deposit can spawn voluminous volcanic mud flows that deliver sediment and destruction to communities many tens of kilometers downstream, and that heat burial impact force and randomness of season and time of day are key factors influencing the biological mortality and survivorship. The eruption challenged the healthcare community to confront many questions, including the physical and psychological risks of living in areas cloaked in tephra fall. And we learned that ensembles of volcanic events are physically intertwined and can occur within minutes and extend for hours or longer. So in this session, we'll hear perspectives on the legacies of this great eruption from five disciplines, volcanology, geophysics, hydrogeomorphology, ecology, and health sciences. These fields represent an informative but an incomplete sampling of the disciplines in which the 1980 eruption had major impacts. And in each discipline, there are enduring scientific and societal legacies that have come into sharper focus over the past four decades. Legacies which science still yearns to understand, and in some instances, society still grapples. So each of our eminent speakers will focus on the legacies of the eruption in their respective fields and the advances the eruption helped fuel. Each speaker is going to have 20 minutes total for their talk. And at the end of the formal presentations, we're going to have a 15-minute panel discussion and further explore the legacies of this eruption. Uh, for those of you <coughs> streaming online, uh, we hope you also enjoy the session. And so with that, uh, we look forward to hearing what our speakers have to say. So our first speaker is Kathy Cashman from Bristol University. And she will talk to us about the contributions of the 1980 eruption to volcanology, a 40-year perspective. Kathy. OK, well, most of the room Faces in the room are familiar, so you don't need a background, but for those of you who were perhaps not alive in 1980, I wanted to give a very brief overview of what was going on before the eruption. Um, the Native Americans had many names for the volcano, and all of them were some variant on Fire Mountain or Smoking Mountain, uh, and they also had stories about places like Spirit Lakes that were inhabited by the Skookums who threw rocks at you. So it was clearly a, a legacy or memory of past volcanic eruptions. In 1978, USGS geologists Rocky Crandall and Don Molino uh, published a bulletin on the future hazards of Mount St. Helens, where they recognized from detailed studies of the Tefra record that Mount St. Helens was the most active volcano in the Cascades. And in fact, uh, very presciently, they noted that it could have an eruption perhaps before the end of this century. So indeed, in March of 1980, uh, 
there was the start of unrest, a very sudden start with pretty intense seismic activity, uh, quite large earthquakes. And then a week later with um, phreatic, phreatomagmatic eruptions from the summit. And very quickly it was recognized that the north flank of the volcano was moving north at an amazing rate of uh, a couple of meters a day. And you can see that uh, north point on the slide. And then on May 18th itself, uh, there was sort of simultaneously a 5.1 earthquake and a landslide of the north, that oversteep and north flank of the volcano that generated a blast as the magma that had been in the edifice, the cryptodome, uh, was depressurized. And then for the following about nine hours, there were variable uh, rates and styles of eruptive activity. So to provide an overview for this talk, it is an impossible task <laughs> to talk about the contributions of Mount St. Helens to volcanology in a mere 20 minutes. So I have decided to focus uh, solely on what happened on May 18th, or primarily on what happened on May 18th. And I really want to try to emphasize the value of the fantastic documentation that we have of this event uh, summarized in the Bible, USGS Professional Paper 1250, but also in this wonderful book that Richard Waite published about five years ago of eyewitness accounts from the volcano, and I will be using those as we go through the day of May 18th. And I want to emphasize this because in this day of social media, we should be able to have this sort of documentation for every eruption, and we don't. <coughs> so the first eyewitness account, um, the famous words of the eruption, David Johnson's call, Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it. Uh, David was stationed in observation point on the uh, a ridge north of the volcano, right in the, the direction of the lateral blast. Uh, there, were, there was also an overflight. Uh, there were some geologists who had hired a small plane, and they happened to be flying right over the north flank and were able to watch first uh, a fracture develop at the summit, and then the entire north flank uh, vibrate, ripple, and churn, huge east-west waves undul undulated like jello. Uh, to the southeast, there were actually a couple of geology students and postdocs who were camped, and they could see the landslide develop from the side. Um, they noted that the, there were two different landslides, and the lower landslide suddenly bunched up, you know, as the other one came over the top. So quite vivid descriptions. The results of the landslide uh, famously were this, was this hummocky topography that was very quickly recognized by uh, volcanologists around the world. It explained this weird uh, geomorphic feature that people had seen. And uh, volcanic landslides or debris avalanche deposits have been, now been recognized in many places. And in fact, a compilation by Lee Siebert in 2002 suggests that a minimum of one in six Holocene volcanoes has experienced uh, flank collapse. And there are others, uh, some of which I put on this map, uh, that have experienced lateral blasts. And the um, image that I have on the map is to remind me, this is a, these beautiful paintings are from the 1792 event of Unsen volcano, where in that case, a debris avalanche entered the ocean and caused a really catastrophic tsunami. A modern review of volcanic landslides and debris avalanches uh, shows, first of all, that these volcanic landslides are unusually fast. They can travel at velocities up to 150 meters per second. Uh, we also now know very well what things look like in the field so that older deposits can be recognized even when that characteristic hummocky terrain has been covered by later uh, events. And analog experiments have reproduced both the horseshoe-shaped amphitheater at the start and the characteristic hummocky morphology of the deposits. Okay, moving on to the lateral blast. Again, fantastic photo documentation. In fact, the, the image on the right, I hadn't seen before putting together this talk. It had popped up you know, somewhere on the internet, and it's a really stunning image. 
Uh, there's also very good eyewitness accounts. So people in the north, some climbers on Mount Rainier and campers at Bear Meadow, uh, noted very distinctly that it was traveling as a density current, a ground-hugging density current, so it would override ridges and then disappear again until it hit the third ridge when the whole, uh, aval or the whole lateral blast lifted off. People on the west side uh, noted, I like this description, the leading edge appeared all around like an inky waterfall. Uh, witnesses who were just barely in the singe zone uh, noted how quickly they got this scorching heat that made it difficult to breathe. And some tree planters on the south side um, were witnessing pyroclastic flows coming over the, the back rim of the volcano and mo rapidly moving down toward them. Uh, an analysis at the time, or in the, the summer, of tree blowdown by Sue Kiefer um, allowed her to model the blast as a supersonic flow, a multi-phase mixture. She was looking at gas and water. However, the geologists in the field were noticing that the deposits looked more like a pyroclastic flow, particularly with large class deposited in the valleys and in the lee of topography. And <clears throat> more recently, uh, uh, analysis by the PISA group has shown that both of these were true. Uh, in their model, they suggest that the blast was supersonic for about 20 seconds, which is a long time if you think about it, and that it then turned into a stratified density current, again, with the flowing down the valleys, but the cloud lifting off uh, as it reached the end of the blast zone. Oops. Uh, that liftoff generated another key characteristic of the eruption, the umbrella cloud. It was very well observed by uh, United Airline pilots. There was a flight from San Francisco to Seattle, and they noted that at 838, they saw this column shoot up through the clouds where they were flying, and that by 843, it had started to spread as a mushroom cloud. And an analysis later of spy satellite photos and to my knowledge, this was probably the first use of spy satellite photos in volcanology, um, showed that initially there were some low clouds, and Rick Hoblet um, has equated these to the interactions of the, the lateral blast with the topography as it was hitting those first ridges. And then uh, at 838, as the pilots noted, the whole uh, cloud started to lift up, and the 843 to 848, where they noted the mushrooming of the cloud, is where the, the rise of the clouds started to level off. However, this this mysterious cloud four that was debated for quite a while of whether it was another lateral blast. And Rick Hoblet, in his 2000 paper, did a wonderful analysis, uh, collected every photograph he could find from every angle, decided that indeed there was not another blast but that this cloud four, which went up to about 30 kilometers, was probably uh, condensation of the water vapor, and so that it was fueled by latent heat of condensation. Okay, later on that day, there was a plenian column, um, and so you had the initial ash cloud going out, and then it continued to be fed throughout the day. Again, there are very good eyewitness accounts of the ash fall on the ground. Uh, the climbers at Mount Rainier noted that they first felt mud balls coming down, and then that turned into a fine ash. Uh, people in, in central Washington, Moses Lake, um, noted this characteristic um, mammatous clouds, very threatening, strange looking clouds. And they also uh, noticed that the next morning, the ash deposit consisted of distinctly different layers. The first was dark gray uh, from the blast, and then they had finer and lighter material from later activity in the day. Um, importantly, the people, these downwinders, were not prepared. They didn't know that they were, they, most of them didn't know there was a volcano back there in the east, I mean in the west. And um, there are a lot of accounts of particularly radio stations uh, scaring people, uh, talking about toxic ash or radioactive ash. And remember, this was only a year after the Three Mile Island nuclear accident, so uh, there was a lot of misconceptions there. I, I wanted to raise a couple of other eyewitness accounts. 
In Billings, Montana, which is over a thousand kilometers uh, to the east, they woke up the next morning to a, co a covering of ash. Uh, the, they couldn't start trucks and cars, and they closed schools. Now this is for a very small amount of ash, well outside the ash cloud that you see on the satellite. And on May 20th, there was an airplane encounter with the ash cloud, a plane, a military plane flying from uh, an Air Force base in Utah trying to get to California, and they actually had to turn around. I wanted to talk a little bit more about this ash cloud. Um, we have from the eyewitness accounts and from the satellite images, we can trace the movement of the cloud front. We can trace the, uh, identify when there was the first ash fall, and you see those two curves diverge because smaller and smaller particles are falling out later. Uh, the satellite photos also showed the later tan ash cloud front from the Plinian phase of the eruption. And I would note that as far as I know, we have this sort of data for only the, the eruptions I know are 1875 eruption of Askia, 1902 eruption of Santa Maria, 1932 eruption of Kizapu, and the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. A couple of other features of the ash deposit. Uh, a map by uh, Sarna and others suggested that the, the ice and mass boundary um, is pushed out to the north, and this is again consistent with the initial ash fall being from the blast, which was sourced from north of the volcano, not from the vent. Uh, and you can see this in a transect that's shown as the red bar and shown on the right, where the grain size distribution along this, the cross plume transect to the north is unimodal and fine-grained, where you just had blast deposit, or primarily blast deposit, and uh, bimodal and more coarse grain to the south, where you were, uh, had mostly the Plinian phase. The one other signature feature of the St. Helens deposit is this secondary thickening, uh, which Carey and Sigurdsson recognized early on could be explained by ash aggregation. And in fact, ash clusters were witnessed in Pullman, Washington from the event. And <clears throat> this has become uh, a very important feature of more recent volcanic ash transport and dispersion models. And now there are a bazillion models out there for ash aggregation, but St. Helens was the first place it was recognized. It was also, uh, the eruption occurred at a key time for testing plume models that were being developed by Wilson and Sparks and Carey and others. And just one example, Carey and Sparks model uh, had suggested that higher plumes will take the same size particle and deposit them farther away from the vent. They also did corrections for wind speed. And from Mount St. Helens, on average, they determined a height of 19 kilometers for the plume and a velocity of 36 meters per second. And I've indicated those in the diagrams on the bottom and show that these assessments are really pretty accurate. So uh, Mount St. Helens was critical for confirming these models. And just one other thing about the main phase of the plume uh, and the importance of photographic documentation. This is a later analysis by Anders and Gardner where they analyzed individual um, photographic or photographs of the plume and could look at the, both the scale of turbulence and the velocity of turbulence as the plume went from a buoyant phase, which is shown on the left, to the collapsing phase uh, later on in the day. And finally, the pyroclastic flows. For obvious reasons, there are no eyewitness accounts of the pyroclastic flows on May 18th, but we have very good documentation of the flows that occurred later in the summer from uh, events after that. And a really brilliant study by, um, by Bill Criswell in 1987, he spent several summers mapping in the pumice plain and was able to compile the pyroclastic flow deposits and assemble a sequence of events by connecting those to all of the geophysical observations that were made during the eruption. So this is, is uh, I think, a really landmark paper. But the pyroclastic flows continue to give information. Uh, they are now being excavated. 
so you keep getting new cross sections. Brittany Brand has done a really wonderful job of um, documenting these cross sections <coughs> and is able to evaluate things like the interactions of the flows with the hummocky topography as the pyroclastic flows went down the Toodle River Valley, um, has been able to look at details of flow dynamics and how the flows actually erode as well as interact with topography. And just a day or two ago, I saw that Jim Valance had a poster uh, looking at the pyroclastic flows from later in the summer of 1980, again, because now they keep being nicely excavated, so you can actually see the cross section through them. And finally, I wanted to mention another feature that, to my knowledge, is, was first recognized uh, during the Mount St. Helens 1980 eruption, and that is that the pyroclastic flows, of course, are density currents, so they went down valleys, which are river valleys, uh, that had water in them. And particularly during the summer of 1980, there were numerous phreatic or secondary explosions. And in the picture on the right, you can see all those pock marks uh, in the deposits that were the result of these individual explosions. However, the, the picture on the left uh, is from a paper by Tom Moyer and Don Swanson. And it's of a secondary explosion that they witnessed a year after the eruption. So uh, that's unusual, but is clearly a hazard that volcanologists should think about when they go out and, and map these flows. And again, you can see in the exposures of the pyroclastic flows uh, now available the, the detailed cross-section of these explosion craters, as shown in the bottom right. So um, that's a very brief overview, and uh, I hope that I have um, convinced you that these, these really detailed documentation, not only by the scientists, but also by whoever was around, uh, have been really critical and uh, the, together have provided an amazing foundation for all of modern volcanology. And I think volcanologists around the world would agree with this fact. Um, we continue to data mine these observations, uh, to test models, uh, as they arise. And um, I also just personally wanted to say that as I put this together, uh, I encountered a lot of ghosts here. Uh, so, so it's a tribute to them as well. And finally, the eruption was clearly important to a lot of us because it made our careers as volcanologists. <laughs> so thank you. Okay, we've got time for a couple questions, if there are any out in the audience. Yes. I'm not a volcanologist, so my question may be basic. Um, my uncle actually lived 50 miles from there, um, so it's pretty personal to me. Uh, but I was curious, you said something about the third cloud being not from the mountain itself. Yes, it is. So uh, as these, that lateral blast went out, uh, the flow is incorporating air and heating it up. And so at some point, uh, well, by the time it hit the third ridge, then the entire mass of that flow, of that density current, was sufficiently buoyant, or the, the finer grain material was sufficiently buoyant that it just lifted off from the entire area. And this was an important observation, and it's still uh, something that we don't incorporate well into our models of ash plume and ash behavior because people usually assume the vent is at the volcano, whereas in this case, <coughs> at least for that early phase, uh, the vent was this very large footprint in front of the volcano. And uh, it, again, that's very well documented, and you say that, that uh, you have relatives near there, that beautiful picture that I put up of the umbrella cloud is a mosaic that the story I know, and Don can correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, someone was visiting his brother, walked out on the porch, saw this, had never used a camera before, picked up a camera and shot that perfect mosaic. So, Great. Thank, Thank you. Okay, so our next speaker will be Seth Moran from the U.S. Geological Survey. 
The title of his talk is The Legacy of the 1980 Mount St. Helens Eruption, Volcano Geophysics and its Use in Volcano Monitoring and Eruption Forecasting. Well, good morning. Um, like Kathy, I found this task to be a little bit uh, overwhelming. There's a lot to talk about in terms of volcano geophysics over the last 40 years at Mount St. Helens. And uh, with apologies to a lot of people, I'm going to focus on a small sliver of that and the role that volcano geophysics played in volcano monitoring and some of the lessons we've learned about how it can be used and some of the challenges with using it in uh, eruption forecasting. So I'm going to start with this slide. And unlike Kathy, I'm going to cover the whole 40 years. Um, this is a time versus depth plot showing all the earthquakes that have been located by the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network. And uh, it's a time versus depth plot, so uh, depth is the vertical axis going from a little above sea level down to 20 kilometers, and then time goes from 1980 all the way to the present. Um, you can uh, see that there's some uh, heterogeneous distribution in hypocenters, and that corresponds to different phases that the volcano has gone through over the last 40 years. There was the 1980 to 86 eruptive time period, and then a period of quiescence from, 2000, from 87 to 2004, another eruptive phase, 2004, 2008, and then the part we're in right now, where um, it's been fairly quiescent. One of the first order observations is that when the volcano is erupting, earthquakes are mainly shallow, and when it's not erupting, they shift to a deeper level. And there's some things we've learned about the magmatic system from that one observation. Going into the way back machine, I'm going to start with where things were before 1980 with uh, the monitoring situation. So in the 1970s, the University of Washington Pacific Northwest Seismic Network uh, installed a number of stations on the western side of in western Washington and uh, put a couple of them near volcanoes, fortunately for us, uh, including one three kilometers to the west of Mount St. Helens called SHW that was installed in 1972. And that station recorded volcanic earthquakes. This is one from 1974, as you can see on a develop quarter film. And uh, one can go through those develop quarter films, as I did as a young grad student, and count things. And this is a plot of monthly counts from 1972 through 1980. You can see that there were time periods where things were kind of interesting, 50, 55 events a month, other time periods where it was down in, uh, south of 10. And a side note is that that's roughly speaking the background level that we see today at Mount St. Helens. An important thing to note in this plot is that there's no hint of any kind of change in seismicity rate in the years or the months leading up to March of 1980 when things really got started. So from the seismic perspective, from the perspective of this one station, there is a zeroth order idea that there was no indication that we were about to have a huge eruption at St. Helens. So things got started with a big earthquake on March 20th, and uh, a 4.2 it was recorded across that seismic network. But since there was only that one station near the volcano, there was a lot of uncertainty in its location. The formal error was about five kilometers, and that allowed for interpretations of it was a volcanic earthquake underneath the volcano or a tectonic earthquake off to the side on a nearby tectonic fault. And that was uh, uncertainty that existed for a couple of days, which is a underlying lesson in that is if you have uncertainty in the observations that you're making, you will have uncertainty in the interpretations and the forecasts that you might make. A couple days into it, it became really apparent that this was not a main shock aftershock sequence. The number of earthquakes went up, not down, and at that point it was fairly clear that uh, things were um, moving in the volcanic direction. And uh, very within seven days, things were happening at the surface. Uh, the first explosion, confirmed explosion on March 27th. So as you might imagine, at this point, scientists went into uh, high gear and uh, in terms of installing a monitoring network that could be used to better track what was going on at St. Helens. On the seismic front, um, there was um, a lot of work that was done to establish a real-time seismic network. This is one of uh, the co-authors on, on this paper, Steve Malone, and this is a picture of him at station DOG, which is one kilometer away from the summit. This was taken on May 16th, which is also an illustration that scientists who were involved in this were taking extraordinary risks to get things up to where they need to be, needed to be. One of the real triumphs of that time is that a network was installed in fairly short order. Within uh, a, a couple of weeks, there was a real-time network that consisted of on the order of 10 stations plus a number of other stations that were out there just recording. 
And uh, this was a really incredible feat given the weather and uh, doing things in, in early April in the Cascades is not ideal, but also back then seismometry was really difficult. The, there were no commercial off the shelf sensors that you could just sort of plunk down and walk away. Um, and batteries, even battery technology, was really messy back then. So it was uh, really uh, an amazing thing that this network came out and very quickly established a world-class seismic network at St. Helens. No different story on the geodetic front. There was a rapid-fire attempt to get electronic distance measuring networks in, uh, installed and, and operational out there. Um, using things like highway reflectors to set up targets at different places on the volcano. This was also hampered by the weather. Um, and then using theodolites to do electronic distance measurements. And uh, this uh, figure on the, uh, the, the photo on the right shows a number of the targets that were, um, that were measured on a fairly routine basis to track deformation on the volcano. This is a plot of that EDM network that was established. And um, one of the things that was fairly quickly realized after a couple of surveys was that the volcano itself wasn't deforming that much except for on the north flank. And this is one of the enigmas of Mount St. Helens that continues to today is that um, evidence of deformation at deeper levels within the magmatic system is hard to find except for during certain periods of time. Um, most of the action was on the north flank, which at that point was visibly bulging and moving to the north at rates of up to two meters per day. These line lengths, you can also look at them in time series, look for changes that might tell you that something is, is happening. This is a line length measurement from Coldwater 2 up to the summit. And you can see there's some variability in rates ranging from about a half a meter a day to about one and a half meters per day. You can also see that there are big gaps in measurements where weather didn't cooperate. And then also importantly, this measurement right there was taken by David Johnston about two hours before the eruption started. So that's a very precious data point. To first order, although there is some variability, there's nothing in this plot that would tell you that something was about to happen on May 18th. Similarly, from the seismic perspective, there was really not much uh, evidence of change after the first week. The black line on this plot shows uh, counts of earthquakes per unit time, and the red line shows seismic energy release per unit time. And you can see actually the number of earthquakes was slowly declining as we moved towards May 18th. The seismic energy level stayed the same because the earthquakes were on average a little bit bigger. But really nothing in this would tell you from an intermediate or long-term perspective that we are moving towards uh, a cataclysmic eruption. And even in the short term, that evidence isn't there. This is a 12-hour plot from station DOG, one kilometer from the summit, and this is the onset of the May 18 eruption. And looking at this record, there's really nothing in there in terms of event rates, event size, event type that would tell you that 8.32 on uh, May 18th was when everything was going to get started. And so one of the more sobering lessons of this eruption is that there was no short-term warning. And there are some things in volcanology that are not forecastable in this sense. Certainly, long-term unrest, it was not a good situation. But uh, the exact timing of that was not something that anybody could have foretold. So that ushered in a six-year time period of eruptive activity at Mount St. Helens, consisting of uh, 20 dome-building eruptions. And in contrast to the <coughs> onset of the May 18 eruption, there was a remarkable track record of successful eruption forecasts during the 1980s. And this was done through a number of uh, different methods to accumulate data. There's things like measuring the progress of thrust faults across the crater floor, measuring widths of ground cracks. This is a technique that, was, that, uh, that originally came from Hawaii. Um, establishing an even denser EDM network that had sites on the crater floor and recorded patterns like this that showed a uh, increasing rate of contraction in this particular, particular case uh, along a line length as you moved towards an eruption. The arrow in that plot corresponds to the time when a forecast was made. The gray bar at the tippity top is the time window for that forecast. And that time window is roughly 10 days, but you can see that the, or the eruption happened right in the middle of that. Another trend that was identified that proved useful for forecasting was uh, just looking at event types, seismic event types. This is a, a plot showing all the events that had been uh, different event types that were recorded on stations. And 
one trend that was uh, noted was that as you move closer towards eruption, events change from high frequency to medium frequency to low frequency, and finally, surface events. Along with that, there was also uh, exponential increases in seismic energy release, uh, both on reg regular old earthquakes, but also on, on surface events. And this is a plot that shows two years of seismic energy data. And the, uh, in, uh, the insets up on the on top and the bottom are from 10 eruptions during that time period. And they all show this pattern of uh, exponential increases in seismic energy release as you got into sort of this days to maybe a week window before an eruption. So all that was rolled up uh, and used, and this is uh, uh, one of my favorite diagrams of, of, uh, of all time from Don Swanson and others, and Don's out here in the audience. And I want to acknowledge Don partly because he's a geologist and he's doing geophysics work. So it was sort of an all hands on deck kind of time. Um, so what this illustrates, there's SO2 on here, there's tilt, there's, in this case, dome expansion, and also seismic energy release. And all the data lines are pointing in the same direction. They kind of light up at different times. And you'll notice at the very tippity top of this, there's a black bar um, that's wide, and then there's another back black bar that's less wide, and then there's one that's really narrow. Those are successive predictive windows that were issued at different times as different monitoring streams came into the picture with these uh, exponential changes. And eruption windows got uh, more and more precise, going from days to, or 10 days to a couple days to, uh, in some cases, uh, hours. And this was really one of the remarkable success stories of the 8086 time period. Okay, now I'm gonna go zooming ahead to 2004, the next eruptive time period, and actually talk about what we learned about the uh, magmatic system leading up to the 2004 eruption that was important in our response to that eruption. So at this point in time, the monitoring networks that were out there, um, the seismic network was pretty good. There were 13 real-time stations, all vertical component, all short period, so there are some limitations. Um, and then there was also a very dense EDM network. In 1998, CVO installed the very first continuous GPS station near Mount St. Helens, about eight kilometers away. And then another one was also put on the a lava dome in 2002. So that was sort of the state of monitoring up to the 2004 eruption. The seismic network allowed for some really interesting work, uh, including a, one of the first P-wave tomography models to be done at a volcano like Mount St. Helens. This is from Jonathan Lees. And uh, this model formed the basis of a conceptual model. Jonathan, uh, this uh, figure here shows some of the main uh, features of the velocity model and how earthquakes wrap up around it. And this uh, conceptual model came out at the same time as another one by John Pallister and others. And uh, this was based on petro uh, petrologic considerations as well as on seismicity. And you can see that there's some pretty decent correlations between these two uh, different kinds of conceptual models. And this was an important thing for us moving forwards in terms of how to interpret the geophysical indications we were seeing about uh, unrest, about what was happening uh, at, at greater depths. One of the things I, I noted early on is that there were this change between deep earthquakes and shallow earthquakes. Um, there were deep earthquakes following the 1980 eruption, and those are plotted on the left. This is um, earthquakes between seven, uh, that are deeper than 7 to 11 kilometers. And you can see that the earthquakes were plotting to the west and the east of the, um, of the crater. In contrast, after 1987, earthquakes were located in different places. And because of the seismic network, uh, we were able to do focal mechanisms, fault plane solutions for a number of these events. And from fault plane solutions, you can extract directions of uh, stress. Um, what I'm showing here are directions of primary compressive stress. And on the left-hand side, those vectors are oriented tangentially relative to the center of the crater. And on the right-hand side, for 1987 onwards, they flip and start going radially. Those uh, were both modeled um, in uh, using stress modeling uh, pr uh, um, procedures. And what came out of that was a pressure decrease for explaining the 1980 deep earthquakes and a pressure increase for 1997 onwards. And we used that to infer that there was some recharge that was going on after the volcano stopped erupting in 1986. On the deformation side of things, I mentioned there was a station that was uh, the continuous GPS. The first one was installed in 1998. And in contrast to the seismic picture, from the deformation perspective, once you take out the tectonic signature, there's no net deformation that was observed on northeast or vertical components 
from 1998 to 2004. No evidence that there was any kind of volume change going on at, uh, at depth. Also, um, INSAR, subsequent INSAR analyses by Mike Pollan and Zhang Lu, this is a stack of 38 interferograms from 1992 to 2001, and there's problems with coherency for sure at Mount St. Helens, but places where there is coherency, there's no fringe patterns that would uh, be uh, consistent with um, uh, deformation from a deeper magmatic source. So, what we knew on September 22nd, 2004, was that there was seismic evidence for recharge, there was no surface deformation consistent with recharge, although monitoring was admittedly quite limited. And we also had a conceptual model for the magmatic system. And that's where we were when on September 23rd, the volcano woke up again. It didn't wake up with a huge earthquake. It woke up instead with a very vigorous swarm of very small earthquakes. This is recorded on a station that was less than uh, 500 meters away from the vent. And uh, initially, it looked like it was a swarm. And we'd seen some swarms before. It was mainly high frequency earthquakes. But about two days into it, we started noticing a change to lower frequency events and even some, uh, some hybrid, that we called hybrid events. And this was our, one of the indications that we thought the volcano was moving uh, in the direction of, of an eruption. There was this, also this GPS station that had been installed on the dome. It was uh, variably operating. Um, this is what uh, the trend lines that, were being that, that, were, that we were finding from 2002 to the beginning of 2004. And the only trend of note was the green one, which is the vertical component. It was going down, which is consistent of the dome subsiding and continued sort of relaxation and cooling from the previous eruption. So uh, September 23rd, unfortunately, this, uh, this station was not working. On uh, five days later, on the 28th, a scientist was flown out to put batteries on and make it work again. And uh, this is what was seen. Um, the black line is the north side, and it, uh, this, uh, north, the dome was no longer subsiding, and it was moving uh, far, uh, fast, away from the vent at a rate of about two and a half centimeters per day, which was uh, a, a confirmation that there was something coming up the pipe. It's worth noting that this station was destroyed in the first explosion on October 1st, which again illustrated that there's some risk taking, uh, ideally you don't do, um, if you don't have a good monitoring network in place. So, first explosion, October 1st, that was, in this case, eight days after the start of unrest, as opposed to 1980, where it was seven days. So, um, the, G, uh, the JRO GPS, the one that was eight kilometers away, uh, that showed a um, trend over the first uh, several days, eight millimeters of motion towards the volcano. You can see that there are error bars that made this a difficult pattern to pick out right away, um, but it uh, nevertheless confirmed this idea that there was magma being uh, moving from greater depth up to, uh, up to the surface. And then this uh, longer term trends, this whole plot goes out to 2006. And uh, that, along with stations that were installed by the Plate Boundary Observatory in response to the eruption, uh, were used to constrain mechanical models of uh, the magmatic system at depth um, using um, compressibility, among other things, and there's a lot of different shapes that will fit the data, but the main important thing is that's a fairly narrow pipe, it seems like, and magma is at some place between 7 and 12 kilometers, the centroid of magma, um, which is consistent with the conceptual model that we'd come up with before. One of the uh, neat things that came out from the geophysics perspective was the development of a tool that we could use to get instruments in close without having people exposed to this, something that was called the spider. It was something that you could hang a seismometer and a GPS uh, over. And um, this is a picture that shows one of the spiders that was installed to track dome motion from 2004 onwards. And this is a path, that, that a tortured path that that particular spider followed with a scale as a tenth of a meter on the side. And this is one of the ways that we tracked the progress and evolution of domes over the time of the eruption. One of the hallmarks of the eruption was that the, uh, something called drum beats, remarkably regularly spaced uh, earthquakes uh, that lasted for months and months, uh, all had similar waveforms. This was the dominant form of seismicity for a couple years, and all told there were several million earthquakes. Some of the drum beats were found to have infrasound attached to them. This was from an uh, infrasound array that was installed a month or so after the eruption started. And one of the implications of this is that perhaps the source of these drum beats involves some form of underground explosion, which is an interesting thing to have in your mind when you're out working there. Speaking of explosions, there, was, there were a couple of explosions, not many. Um, and this is the biggest one from March 8th. Uh, it was, um, most of these were unheralded. 
And uh, this one turned out to be a little bit heralded. There was an uptick in RSAM about two hours ahead of time on many stations, which turned out to be due to a slight increase in event size. Um, this was recognized, but it wasn't clear what the significance was, and so we didn't do anything with it. And it illustrates that restless and erupting volcanoes can produce explosions with little or no, no warning, just like what happened with White Island a couple of days ago. Um, final thing I'll say, actually, I'm going to skip through this because I'm running out of time. Last thing I want to focus on is what's happening right now. Um, so now we have a really good network, 20 seismic stations, 20 GPS stations, and um, a lot of this is due to collaborations with Plate Boundary Observatory and uh, the PNSN. Um, we've been able to do fault plane solutions and again are finding that these blue dots are, are uh, directions of maximum compressive stress. The blue arrows are regional and uh, what it shows is that there's a rotation that we infer is due to um, recharge coming in from the volcano itself. The GPS stations, uh, for a time, were moving away from the volcano, which is consistent with recharge, although that has now stopped. And then also there is a gravity increase observed from surveys close into the, uh, the volcano within four kilometers, and that indicates an increase in mass with uh, interpretation of recharge plus some shallow groundwater. And all that led us to issue an information statement on 2014 that Mount St. Helens is recharging and getting ready for the next eruption, which we infer would happen days to weeks, uh, days to decades, years to decades, not days to weeks, years to decades from uh, the mo present moment. And uh, with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Um, in the interest of keeping on schedule, we'll reserve questions now, but I will encourage the audience and remind you that at the end of our formal presentations, we will have all our speakers for a panel discussion. So if you have any questions for Seth, uh, feel free to ask him at that time. Okay, and our next speaker is going to be Karen Grand from the University of Minnesota Duluth. She'll be talking about Mount St. Helens, lessons learned on the impacts of extreme sediment loading on hill slopes and fluvial systems and their uh, recovery trajectories. Karen? All right, well, thank you very much. And I wanna first thank the conveners for putting this together and note that it's a little daunting to be giving this talk in front of many of the people who actually collected these data back at the time that Mount St. Helens erupted. I'm gonna take a slightly different approach and look primarily at what has happened since the eruption. I wanna give a quick overview of the impacts of explosive eruptions on the landscape and talk about lessons learned from Mount St. Helens on how these different environments respond and recovered from the eruption. I want to focus on three main areas, the debris avalanche deposit, the tephra-covered hill slopes, and then the fluvial system. And we'll look at each of these individually and then sort of pull them together to look at long-term sediment yields and different phases of recovery from an explosive eruption. I'll talk a little bit more detail about fluvial recovery using examples from Mount St. Helens, and then I'm going to tiptoe away from Mount St. Helens and use some examples from Mount Pinatubo as well. This is what Mount Pinatubo erupted in June of 1991, and this is where I've done most of my research. Um, my work there has been and continues to be heavily influenced by the work at Mount St. Helens, and particularly the research that was done on the North Fork Toodle River. So this is a nice figure that comes from a review paper by Pearson and Major on the hydrogeomorphic impacts of explosive eruptions. And they detail a handful of different locations where you might expect to find impacts. The first comes from the eruption cloud itself, which then rains tougher down on the surrounding landscape. The tephra can range in size from volcanic bombs down to fine-grained ash, smother vegetation, and uh, fundamentally alter the hydrology and geomorphology of those hill slopes. Sometimes those eruption clouds collapse back on themselves, leading to pyroclastic density currents. These primarily are flowing down valleys, but when they deposit, they are essentially valley-filling deposits that eradicate the pre-existing channel network in those locations. The debris avalanche that's noted here comes from a different process, the volcanic edifice collapse, but likewise has a similar impact in that it tends to fill valleys and eradicate the pre-existing topography there. And then lastly, there are lahars. These are the hyper-concentrated flows, mud flows, and debris flows that flow down the major river valleys around the, erupt around the volcano. Um, unlike the other um, processes here, lahars can last for a sort of years to decades following the actual time of eruption, and they can contribute to sort of the hydrologic aftermath of the eruption, which for many downstream communities is um, as devastating or even more devastating than the eruption itself. So I think everyone in the room now should know that the, uh, Mount St. Helens had its first climatic eruption in May of 1980 and began with the north flank collapse 
which triggered the debris avalanche that ended up in the North Fork Toodle River Valley. And Kathy kind of alluded to this earlier, one of the big sort of aha moments in terms of landscape impacts from the eruption was the sort of ubiquity of these debris avalanche deposits and the hummocky terrain that they leave behind. And so these are just a few of the papers that came out shortly after the eruption, sort of pulling this together. Landslides from volcanoes seen as common. Given the example of Mount St. Helens catastrophic collapse, geologists are recognizing volcanic debris avalanches elsewhere. And in the life cycle of many volcanoes, a catastrophic collapse is a normal event. Um, and so this is something that now has to be added into the bag of hazards to pay attention to. But in addition to sort of the actual existence and ubiquity of these debris avalanche deposits, there are also lessons to be learned about how the landscape evolved on this hummocky disconnected sur surface that sort of was deposited in the North Fork Toodle River Basin. So if we think about how drainages evolve and how networks connect over time, there's two main processes by which that happens. One is sort of a bottom-up approach where you have nick points that are migrating upstream on channels, capturing upper parts of the watershed. And the other is a top-down approach from sort of fill and spill, where you have basins that essentially fill and overtop. Once those channels initiate, they tend to incise and then widen and sometimes aggrade. This liberates a lot of sediment, and that sediment moves downstream into the river valleys. On the hummocky surface of the North Fork Toodle River debris avalanche, the drainage network and integration occurred in just under three years, and most of it was from that sort of top-down fill-and-spill approach. This is not from Mount St. Helens, but I just want to point out that the ability to actually watch landscape evolution and drainage sort of network integration in real time is rare. And so places like the debris avalanche at Mount St. Helens and the pyroclastic flow deposits uh, later at Mount Pinatubo have given us the opportunity to actually watch drainages connect in real time. And it's inspired my thinking, at least, um, on how drainage network evolution happens in places that are completely unrelated to volcanic uh, areas. This is actually a post-glacial landscape in southern Minnesota and has the same kind of hummocky disconnected surface where you have drainages that are integrating both through sort of bottom-up nick point migration as well as fill and spill from the top. So getting back to Mount St. Helens, um, that north flank collapse triggered the lateral blast that led to the removal of vegetation up close to the volcano and then singeing of vegetation further out. And then tephra fall was deposited over this entire landscape. And so it gives us the opportunity to now see how hill slopes evolve from uh, tephra fall. So I think it's well documented that when you get fine grain ash that lands on a landscape, it uh, dramatically impacts infiltration rates. Uh, we expect the pre-eruption rates were probably on the order of 75 to 100 millimeters per hour. This is sort of rates that people have found on non-impacted uh, watersheds in the Cascades. Um, and they were measured as low as two to five millimeters per hour shortly after the eruption. Within a year, these had increased, but they were still less than 10. And then I think one of the real uh, benefits of being able to, to sort of watch the science that's happened at Mount St. Helens is that we have almost 40 years of data now. So 20 years after the eruption, um, we're up to 9 to 25 millimeters per hour, still significantly lower than pre-eruption values, but they are increasing over time. Now, it's not just infiltration capacities that are impacted. The vegetation die-off also have a, has a really big impact on the hydrology. Essentially, you've lost interception, and so a lot more water reaches the ground surface than before. The loss of interception as well as reduced evapotranspiration and the reduced infiltration all lead to increases in overland flow. This water is then pumped into channels that are sort of smooth and straightened from the lahars that were generated following the eruption, and that leads to increases in discharge. And there were measurable increases in discharge on the order of tens of percents uh, for over five years on the North Fork Toodle River in particular. So if we have more overland flow, we have really fine grained tephra on the hill slopes, what does that do to erosion rates? Right, erosion rates increased rapidly and then declined um, relatively quickly over the course of a year or two on tephra-covered hill slopes. This is work by Collins and Dunn, where they were actually able to track the processes associated with sheet wash, rapid development of rills, and then those rills started to sort of combine together and then get smoothed out through rain splash and bioturbation. And so this would seem to imply that the reduction of that tephra erosion is a, is a relatively quick impact that decays away rather quickly. Um, again, Mount St. Helens was almost 40 years ago, so they went back 10, 20, 30 years later to measure erosion rates and found continued low rates. So this sort of supports this idea that this pulse of tephra erosion off of hill slopes is relatively quick. 
There was a paper that came out earlier this year by Oliver Korup and others that uh, hints at another process associated with hill slope um, erosion following major explosive eruptions. They looked at post-eruption landslides, not ones that happened right after the eruption, but these are happening sort of two to four, or four to six years after the eruption on two Chilean volcanoes in areas that tephra fall was intense enough to kill off vegetation. And so they're attributing this sort of lingering or a lag, I guess, in uh, landslides to the die-off of vegetation, loss of root strength, loss of cohesive strength on the landscape, and then the ensuing uh, landslides. At Kai 10, the volume of sediment associated with these post-eruption landslides is on par with the amount of tephra that was eroded in the first year or two. So this is a potentially significant contributor of sediment to sort of the longer-term uh, sediment loads coming off of impacted landscapes. So the other two main processes that we had at St. Helens that impacted the landscape, the pyroclastic flows, which you heard about earlier from Sean and Kathy, as well as lahars, which went down most of the major rivers. Um, I'm not actually going to say a whole lot about these uh, specifically. Let's talk about the sediment response. All right, we know that there was a hydrologic response on the hill slopes with reduced infiltration, loss of vegetation, increased runoff, flashier floods. We know there is an increase in the abundance of uh, sediment to be eroded, so we have this fine grained tephra on hill slopes. All of that drainage in integration, the incision and widening associated with that, leads to pulses of sediment coming off of the debris avalanche as well as pyroclastic flow deposits, sort of valley filling deposits. You get a lot of longitudinal disequilibrium in the fluvial system and really high lateral migration rates. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But basically, lots of water and lots of sediment leads to really high sediment loads. So this is a compilation that also comes from the Pearson and Major paper that shows sediment yields for watersheds uh, that drain volcanoes that erupted in the last few years. And they're compared to those light gray dots, which are the um, sort of non-impacted, non-volcanic systems. I think it's been very well established now that uh, sediment yields following volcanic eruptions are some of the highest in the world that are ever recorded. So this is a significant load. Um, you can see Mount St. Helens kind of located down and through here. Most of these data have been collected since that 1980 eruption on a series of other volcanoes. And so the question you might ask is, okay, we have really high sediment loads. How do they evolve over time? So that's, again, we can turn to Mount St. Helens, which has almost 40 years of data now to look at. These are some data for the first sort of eight to nine years after the eruption from an excellent series of uh, monitoring stations that were installed on major river valleys draining the flanks of the volcano. So the USGS put together a series of monitoring stations to measure discharge as well as suspended sediment <coughs> concentrations. You can get sediment yields over time. And what you can see, this is a log scale, is that things were declining sort of non-linearly or exponentially um, after the eruption. Really high sediment loads and then this decay away. And that's actually pretty common. Um, there have been a number of volcanoes now where people were able to measure sediment yield in some capacity and see this decay through time. And there's a lot of work that goes into trying to come up with a reasonable decay coefficient because it helps you figure out how much sediment you might expect to come off of the rivers draining the volcanoes. But what happens after that first initial pulse? Well, we have almost 35 years of data here that were put together in a compilation by Major et al. last year. And you can see that they stopped decaying and they, start, they remain high even here through over three decades after the eruption. And so I wanna draw your attention to a couple features on this plot. The, the white dashed line here and then the dark gray in the background, these are the mean and the range for other Cascade rivers, so ones that were not impacted by the eruption. And so that's where we might expect those rivers to eventually get back down to when they have essentially recovered from the eruption. But a lot of them are staying in order of magnitude or even more higher than that. And so what's going on? Why are these sediment yields staying high for so long? Well, let's take a look at some of these different depositional surfaces. This is sort of 20 to 30 years after the eruption. And you might notice that there's vegetation growing on the debris avalanche deposit, on some of the lahar deposits, even on some of the areas in the blast zone. But there's not a whole lot of vegetation in the North Fork Tootle River braid plain. All right, vegetation is both a sign of stability as well as a stabilizing influence. And so the lack of vegetation tells you something about the high mobility of this system. This is an image taken from last year, thank you Google Earth, of the North Fork Tootle River. And you can see that the braid plain still remains unvegetated. And also you might see all of these um, highly available sediment sources here if the channels were just migrating laterally into them. So there's still a real abundant source of sediment within the fluvial system. 
In addition to the excellent network of monitoring stations, there were also a series of monumented cross sections set up on the major rivers draining St. Helens, as well as um, more recently repeat LIDAR data that have been flown that allowed you to see volumetrically changes in erosion and deposition throughout the system. This is just an example of one of those many monumented cross sections. This is from a paper that came out by Major and all earlier this year. And so you can see that there have been different episodes of vertical incision followed by valley widening and um, lateral migration over time. And they attribute sort of some of the, the biggest changes over the last decade, especially more related to lateral migration than to vertical incision. And so that tells you that perhaps a, that lingering um, high sediment load in the fluvial system is associated with lateral migration of these channels. So pulling all these data together from Mount St. Helens, from Mount Pinatubo, from other eruptions, I put together this conceptual model to think about how different sediment sources turn on and turn off after a major explosive eruption and separate it into two main phases. And phase one, we can call that the immediate aftermath. So these are when some of these really high sediment loads um, come off of the system. We have that immediate pulse from the hill slope tephra that's eroding through sheet wash and rilling. We have these sort of slightly more prolonged but in important contributions from network extension and valley creation. And those are coming out of these valley filling deposits like the debris avalanche deposit or pyroclastic flows. But then in phase two, those have sort of decayed away for the most part, but you have this long lingering instability in the fluvial system over that time. And so to look a little bit more detail into what might be happening during this phase two time, I'm gonna, like I said, take you away from St. Helens for a few minutes and we're gonna go to the Philippines to Mount Pinatubo. Pinatubo er er erupted in June of 1991. It was about 10 times more voluminous than Mount St. Helens. And the primary impacts were associated with pyroclastic flows, um, some tephra fall, and then lahars. So the light blue area that you see here is the extent of the primary pyroclastic flows um, at Pinatubo. And if you look further downstream on the rivers, you can see some of the original lahar deposits from those first six months. I done, did most of my research on the east flank of this volcano, looking at rivers that had very different impacts from the eruption. And I'll show you just a little bit of data from the Pasig Petrera River here, which had about one third of the watershed covered with primary pyroclastic flow deposits. Um, it's probably one of the closest rivers to the North Fork Toodle River at Mount St. Helens. Again, we have these two phases for watershed recovery. The immediate aftermath, or phase one, at Pinatubo was predominantly um, dealt with uh, the impacts of lahars. So there were hundreds of lahars that were spawned following um, the Pinatubo eruption, and they were devastating to downstream communities. What you can see here uh, was the city of Bacalor, and all that's left is the Red Roof Cathedral from a Spanish-era cathedral there. Um, really, during phase one, the rivers were constantly being reset. There was a lot of longitudinal disequilibrium in the system. And in order for phase two, that fluvial recovery, to begin, we had to get past sort of these um, abundant lahars. So that's five to ten years after the eruption. But at the time that that fluvial uh, recovery phase was started, the rivers were still mobile, braided, sandy, highly mobile. The major sediment sources at the time were erosion of uh, pyroclastic flow deposits and lahar deposits that eroded through two main processes, uh, rilling and gullying in some cases and mass wasting in others. And there's also abundant sediment available in the valley bottom. And it's limited to some degree by internal feedbacks associated with selective transport, uh, winnowing and armoring of the system. So if we took a look at some grain size data from the Pasig Petrero, um, these come from 1996 up to about two decades after the eruption. Um, to orient you zero here on the x-axis is the alluvial fan head, and we're going 15 kilometers upstream. And it's fine at the top and coarse at the bottom. And so what you can see is that overall, the river has been coarsening over time. I'll draw your attention to the circles in the middle, uh, the 2001 data, so that was 10 years after the eruption. There are rainy season and dry season data plotted on top of each other, and they're basically indistinguishable. But by the time you get two decades out after the eruption, so the 2009 and 2010 data, there's actually quite a difference between sort of these rainy season, really fine grain deposits, and then the coarse um, dry season channels. And so what we're starting to see is this shift back and forth forth between uh, sand bedded rainy season channels and gravel bedded in size dry season channels. And that has implications for sediment transport. The sediment transport overall is still dominated by rainy season transport. There's, that's not too surprising. But this dry season signal is starting to last longer and longer into the rainy season. And I think we're starting to look at the processes that are gonna happen as these channels start to stabilize um, and the sediment sources that go into them start to, uh, start to deplete. 
The other change that's been happening there is that vegetation is actually able to last through the rainy season. This photo was taken in 2009, the first time I saw vegetation on the braid plain during the rainy season. Normally it would get wiped out. And it's a rather complex interaction of highly migratory channels, the stabilizing influence of vegetation, and other feedbacks associated with it. But I think we're starting to see some of the processes that are going on in this fluvial recovery phase. And so to kind of pull it all together and sum it back up, Mount St. Helens truly is the master teacher when we think about how landscapes respond to explosive eruptions. There was a lot of really detailed work done both in the short term as well as this amazing long-term data set. And that's really, really rare to have a long-term data set following an explosive eruption. We talked a little bit about tuff-recovered hill slopes, um, that channel network evolution in those valley filling deposits, and then that long lingering instability of the fluvial system. And there's lessons to be learned from all of these different elements. And I also want to point out that the research done at Mount St. Helens impacts our understanding of a lot more than just other explosive eruptions. And fundamentally, we're looking at the mechanics of extreme sediment loading and transport. And this has applicability to other environments, like dam removals, or rivers following wildfires, or major landslides. How do rivers process and remove um, all of this excess sediment? And then lastly, there's a lot to be learned from landscape evolution channel network extension in environments that may be very far away from the volcanoes themselves. Thank you. So we have time for a question if anyone has one. Okay, don't see any questions right now. So we'll thank Karen and we'll move on to our next speaker. Okay, we're going to continue on the sort of the evolution of the terrain after uh, volcanic events with a talk by Virginia Dale from the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. She'll be talking about the ecological recovery in the aftermath of the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens, lessons learned during the 39 years of research, questions remaining, and paths ahead. Thank you so much. This has already been so interesting. And as you've heard, March 20th, 1980 was an important time in volcanology. But I want to tell you that it was an important time in ecology. And personally, to me, I gave my thesis defense at the University of Washington that day. So I was kind of ready to go when this eruption happened. We had the proposal written before May 18th, and I was on the first team of ecologists who helicoptered into the area. I feel so fortunate to be able to continue what's almost a 40-year study now and to work with so many great ecologists and uh, geologists who've taught me a lot over the years. So today I want to talk about the, what we've learned. And a lot of this is based on two books that um, Charlie Crisofoli and I put together. The first book was also helped by um, Fred Swanson that synthesizes a lot of um, the learnings. And the major point I want to make is that the, during the eruption, there were a diversity of disturbances, and so there were a diversity of recovery patterns. And it was very important um, who survived and what we call biological legacies, the rocks, the organisms, um, the plants that survived. Um, and then uh, there were very unique successional processes, depending on the disturbance type, and refer at the last to the constraints of long-term research in ecology. So we've talked about different types of disturbances in the earlier presentations. Um, we had volcanic processes, we had flow class, we had erosion, but the mechanisms were very important to the organisms that, that were there, whether it was extreme heat, burial, impact force, abrasion, and the intensity of the disturbance. Basically, the further you got from the mountain, um, the less the impact was. But within disturbance type, you had differences. And in some cases, topography provided a very important protection for the surviving plants and animals. So I want to refer quickly to the different types of disturbance. There's the crater itself. And because of recent activity, of course, there's very little going on there. There's the pyroclastic flow. I'm glad we've heard so much about the debris avalanche deposit because that is where my work is focused and those hummocks are very important. The mud flow or lahars um, have also been important and recovery's been pretty fast there. We heard briefly about the singe zone and that was pretty cool because the heat was strong enough to burn the leaves off the trees but the force wasn't enough to kill them. And the deciduous trees that 
typically uh, respond to um, loss of leaves, did better. We have the blowdown zone and then we have the heavy ash deposits. Um, I want to refer to this concept of Ronquier's life forms that Ronquier invented to explain climate change in response to plants, but we found it related to survival of the disturbance. So it deals with the position of the buds and trees like this depiction. Um, they're pretty high up, but you have other plants like lilies where the surviving um, part over the winter is under the ground. And we found this pattern was very important because when we look at um, survival after the eruption on the debris avalanche deposit, the only plants that survived had their buds under the ground, as indicated by brown. Most of them on the singe and blowdown also had their buds under the ground, but the mudflow trees survived that had their buds above the ground. These trees were staunch enough that the flow could go by and some of them were left standing. Um, also in the tephra deposit, um, the trees were very important as well. So this was an interesting pattern that we observed. Um, and besides life form, life history was very important. For example, the Andromenus fish, salmon, were out at sea, and so many of them survived. Um, many migratory birds had not returned. The eggs and resting stages of zooplankton provided some survival in some places. Organism size, as I've alluded to, were very important, with large species and individuals having greater mortality in the blast area, um, but the tall trees surviving in the mud flows. Um, habitat associations were important. For instance, um, plants that, and animals that live below the ground um, could survive when the disturbance was largely above the ground and the tephra deposit was shallow, less than um, a, a, a few centimeters or in some cases um, half a meter or so. The low statute plants had greater mortality in that tephra fall zone. And then the influence of survivors, of course, was really important. Um, on the debris avalanche deposit, we found plants like this carex that were growing from a root wad. And many times I was digging under this material to find what the surviving piece of material was and could determine what came out of there. Animals in the refugia of the blastome were very important. Charlie Corsifoli has documented these pocket gophers that survived when the deposit wasn't deep enough and then brought up the mineral soil and mixed it in and that mixing was very important. So um, also the sources of, um, of animals and plants from adjacent non-disturbed area was very important and they came in and like the pocket gophers improved site conditions. Um, and then eventually we had all of the biotic interrelationships um, occurring, herbivores, predation, um, scavengers, decomposers, and so the, all the biological processes are going on now. The dispersal pattern and rate was very important. I put up um, sea traps like, like these um, along our 103 um, permanent plots that were on the debris avalanche deposit and could determine that the source populations um, were from areas outside by the species that came in. Um, but there were more seeds in the middle of the debris avalanche deposit, which is not what we would predict, but we thought that was from wind patterns that were mainly up the North Fork of the Tootle River. Um, <clears throat> so site improvement was also <clears throat> very important in this area. We found that the initial substrates had very low um, nutrient status, little moisture holding capacity. Um, Limited shade, um, it was very hot out there. They were very permeable, sand-sized materials largely. Um, and improvements occurred over time doing weathering, decomposition, and mixing of soils, um, and, and water flow, this erosion that moved, removed a lot of the fine materials. And in the case of lakes, you had um, suspended particles that eventually settled to the bottom. We were very excited when you found any plants coming through. This is one of my favorite pictures. Um, but this required uh, suitable conditions for the plants to get established. And so we got very good at identifying the cotyledons. And that habitat structure was very important. So once you had one plant established, often it would produce a little shade or would catch another um, plant and moisture. And so other plants could get established. Um, we found interesting phenomena, like some plants were attaining um, sexual maturity in a very young stage that you wouldn't have predicted. Um, ability to fix nitrogen for some of these plants was very important. And so these biotic um, interactions were really 
critical. And because they were developing, there was an increase of diversity and cover over time. This is a field of lupins that have nitrogen fixing ability, the association of bacteria with their roots that's very important. Um, and it was a fairly sparse system, but as I've said, it was pretty rich in terms of the ecological interactions that occurred. I wanted to show you a picture of red alder because it became so important on the debris avalanche deposit. This is the tallest tree that we found in, in 1990. Five, um, red alder is one of the fastest growing trees of the world, in the world. It has a very high germination rate and can, and can um, produce seeds as young as five years old. It again is a nitrogen fixing um, species, so these life history characteristics were very important. Um, <clears throat> but the species <coughs> accrual, both in terms of plants and animals, was very important. And in all of these disturbance types, there's been an increase in the number of species and in vegetation cover and in the complexity of the vegetation structure as well as the abundance of the animals. These elk herds that occur on the debris avalanche deposit are very important, as I'll allude to later. Um, this is a figure from one of Charlie Crisofoli's um, uh, publications that shows the increase in small mammal um, species over time, and there's just a continual buildup of these species on the deposits. Now, after this eruption occurred, there was great concern about what would happen, and um, emergency money was available, so this, what was called the Soil Conservation Service at that time um, was uh, allocated uh, $16 million, and they had to spend it within six months. So what they decided to do was aerially seed um, exotic species largely over much of the area. And one of them was on the debris avalanche deposit. Um, and although we had tried to get this stop, I was at the Second International Congress of Systematics and Evolutionary Biology, and they sent a um, petition that vigorously opposed any proposal for mass seeding of grasses or any other species on the newly created substrate. It was done. I happened to be standing out in the field, and I was seated upon by this <laughs> helicopter. I was just appalled, but because I was there and I could see the seeds on the ground, I knew exactly where they fell relative to our plots. So a year later, this is what those seeds look like, and I knew that 15 of our plots had been seeded upon. And what we found in the early years that um, the conifers that came into those 15 plots died out more quickly than the co little conifer seedlings that were in the other plots. And we think it was because there was a buildup of mice population, there was a lot of grass seed to eat, on those plots. And so they ate the, ring the trees during the winter, and so there was greater mortality of those conifers. And the seeds were introduced to reduce erosion. There was no evidence that that happened, as you've heard. Erosion was pretty massive in this area. Um, but we are interested in looking at what the long-term effects on the vegetation are, because we do want vegetation cover. So I show you one picture on the left of the not seeded plots and another one on the uh, seeded plots. We've done some analysis and there was no morphology difference that um, was discernible between these two plots, but you could see the seeded plots had a lot greater cover, greater cover. Um, and so over time, we could see that vegetation cover on all plots has increased to about um, 60 or 70 percent, but the seeded plots in the solid line um, have greater cover than the unseeded plots in the dotted line. We also see that the number of seeded plants um, on the um, uh, seeded plots is greater than that on the unseeded plots over time. That imp impact has continued. And we were interested in native plants during versus non-native plants. And again, their greater, their greater number of plant species cover on the seeded uh, plots, on the seeded plots as compared to the unseeded plots. So this effect has occurred for a long period of time. Um, and so when, we, when ecologists look at succession, this is the kind of pattern that we often have seen before the eruption. But after the eruption, and based on all of the work that we have learned as summarized in those two books we've mentioned, we've understood that there are a lot of different patterns. So there's a primary disturbance and its diverse impacts. Disturbance to ecological systems is just not one event. There were a lot of different things going on. Survivors were very important, and that hadn't been emphasized before. Survivor mortality is important. Um, 
Uh, you have creation of new habitats. Um, you have dispersal filter, but also we talk about landscape permeability, the fact that um, when plants or animals come into a site, they may not be able to survive in that site. It often may be low moisture. There may be predators. We observed one case where there were 13 um, individual plants of fireweed that I thought was going to be really important because they were out in the middle of nowhere, but um, there were also three hornworn caterpillars at that site, and the next time we came back, they were decimated. So that wasn't a good place to be. Um, so local conditions, both um, physically and biologically, were very important. Secondary disturbances were critical. This was not just the event. There was erosion that occurred, landslides, weathering events, um, volcanic events, and insect outbreaks, as well as outbreaks of pathogens that occur. And then random events were very important as well, like those three hornworm caterpillars. Those were hard to predict. So one of the um, phenomena that uh, has been very important is thinking about the challenges of long-term ecological uh, studies. There are ongoing disturbances that influence what happens, and besides these natural events, the human activities were very important. I talked about the um, seeding of these um, uh, exotic grasses and legumes by the Soil Conservation Service. There were also efforts to reduce erosion um, by, by putting in sediment uh, retention ponds and other physical structures to stop that. I had a loss of um, many, uh, about a third of my permanent plots. There's 62 remaining, and I was, that's just by chance, the way we happened to put the transects out. It's difficult to secure funding, although when we got the funding from NSF uh, in May 1980, it was the fastest turnaround time ever that they've recorded. Since then, um, people aren't so excited about um, funding something that's been going on a long time. Uh, there's also been changes in taxonomy, which is a challenge. 35% of our plant species have changed their names. <laughs> and this is partly due to the genetics, but um, keeping up with the names is, and keeping up with these massive data records is, is really quite difficult. And also there have been changes in technology. When we first put the plots out, there was no GIS, there was no GPS, um, and keeping up with the data records was hard. So we, when we first came out with um, the GPS system, we marked all of our plots that were there, but then we came back the next time, they were all offset, and we, we couldn't figure it out. And that is because if you remember, some of you, when, this, when GPS was first used, it was a military secret and they offset everything so that nobody could figure it out. Well, we, we finally got the formula and so we had, could backtrack to where our plots were, but then originally did it, um, got the new measures. But we had challenges like that coming up. But this has also been a lot of fun. I wanted to show you a few of the Mount St. Helens anniversary cakes. Every year on May 18th, I have a cake, and we have to talk about the accurate geology of these caves, starting with the strawberry layer, the magma underneath, and then we have um, the you know mountain cone and the glacier that's still there. We have, if you can see, the pretzels of the blown down trees. Later in years, we started getting the vegetation coming back. I found um, gummy uh, butterflies, and they are coming back now. And I found adults and kids really like, really enjoy this, and they learn a lot from it. And so now I'm not doing it just on May 18th. I just gave a talk to some uh, elementary school girls, and they loved talking about the cake and eating the cake. So I make a lot of these cakes. <laughs> um, there are some remaining questions. You know, ecological changes occur over thousands of years, um, not, the, not as long as geologic times, but um, we still wonder what's going on in many cases and being able to predict what the changes are. Um, there's been a lot of work in eco ecology about indicators. What are indicating changes in systems? But there hasn't been very much thought about how these relate to disturbances, such as big events like the big eruption and smaller events like the erosion that has occurred. So the proposed indicators that have come up range in a very small um, time and spatial scale, looking at the microbial diversity, all the way up to the spatial distribution of, of um, the plants. And so we are proposing to be able to look at these and be able to come up with a prediction of what may be changes in these systems. Another very interesting phenomena is thinking about the relationship between 
um, ecological conditions, and the recent prevalence of elk hoof disease. If you can see, this map shows that the disease prevalence that has just come up in recent years is centered around Mount St. Helens. And when we talk to the veterinarian who's looking at this, she's thrilled to know we have soil samples going back to um, 1981. The hypothesis is that um, the elk may be um, succumbing because there's nutrient deficiency in these soils, or there may be mineral deficiency. On Monday, I was talking to someone who learned that her soils at St. Helens, compared to the Pacific Northwest, have lower aluminum. Or it may be that the soil characteristics promote the pathogen survival. And so this is going to be really interesting to study. So I thank you for the presentations and for all the people who've helped us with the um, efforts that they've contributed to our work over time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Virginia. Um, so we'll move on to our final talk of the session um, to keep ourselves on schedule so that we have plenty of time for our panel discussion. So our final speaker will be Peter Baxter, and he will be uh, transitioning us into sort of the effects on human health. His talk is entitled Identifying Human Health Hazards and Communicating Risk Interruptions. How far have we come? Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you to the conveners for inviting me. Um, I'm focusing this talk on volcanic ash, in fact, uh, which was the main public health issue uh, following this eruption. The, what are the health consequences of, 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 of being exposed to volcanic ash? And uh, before this eruption, uh, nobody ever thought about the health effects of volcanic ash and so when this question first arose um, after this, in, in this eruption, um, this was brand new territory to explore, and it was impossible to reassure people who were exposed to the ash that we had any uh, reliable knowledge at all on the health consequences. I should also say that um, there was a state of unrest for two months, during which time there was extensive emergency planning around the volcano and although uh, in the last 4,500 years, heavy ash falls have occurred east of the volcano, and that was well known, in fact, there was no preparation or planning for ash falls east of the volcano. And uh, so when they occurred, the population was totally taken by surprise, and there was no warning. They thought that uh, an eruption at Mount St. Helens wouldn't affect them at all. And so this was, a, this was a really an astonishing state of affairs for about a million people living east of the volcano. I arrived uh, at M Mount St. Helens uh, at Se in Seattle on the Wednesday after the Sunday eruption, and um, <clears throat> I, di I di knew nothing about volcanoes or what the situation was. I'd been sent there by the Centers for Disease Control because there was a request for advice on the health effects of volcanic ash. I didn't know anything about this, but when I arrived, uh, President Carter had just uh, made the area, the state of Washington, a national disaster zone. Um, people were worried that the big eruption could possibly be a precursor to a much larger one. And also people worried that other volcanoes in the Cascades might start to erupt, and even that the San Andreas Fault could trigger a major earthquake uh, down here in San Francisco. So there was a very high level of general alert and worry amongst the population in the entire area. Just by way of background, from a medical and epidemiological point of view, um, uh, the uh, studies of natural disasters didn't really kick off health studies or medical studies on the effects, the impacts of natural disasters in general didn't kick off till the last uh, quarter of the 20th century, even though going back to the Great Lisbon earthquake in 1755, the thinkers of the time began to get very interested in what could be the uh, natural causes of uh, natural disasters like this powerful earthquake, other than just supernatural events. 
Uh, but the first studies were actually started, to, uh, the first impact studies on humans were begun, in fact, by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, which had a, a growing role in providing epidemiological studies of, of uh, medical relief in major disasters. But people were beginning to take the opportunity to study at the same time, uh, using epidemiological techniques, uh, the impacts and the causes of the impacts in humans in events like earthquakes, for instance. And in 1976, uh, the first study showed that building type, uh, a specific building type, in this case Adobe building blocks, were responsible, for, mainly responsible for fatalities and injuries uh, in the Guatemala earthquake um, where 26,000 people died. So in this tradition, um, I embarked on <coughs> initially, and then we formed a large team to investigate this problem. Uh, now, I put this up because um, this kind of work in natural disasters has to be extremely ad hoc, and you have to go with, with a sort of feeling of serendipity of what chance might produce, and then how can you gather data very quickly and efficiently, but data which are perishable, and unless you set up ad hoc studies straight away without any formal planning, you're going to miss uh, the very objective of why you went in the first place. And the eruption itself, as I say, was a completely unknown entity for most of us involved. When I arrived, I had no idea, as I say, but I was quickly brought up to date that it was a sort of catastrophe in the center of Washington state uh, as a result of the ash fall. And to summarize this very briefly, th in fact, this, it's interesting that Society can be brought totally to a halt uh, by an ash fall, even quite a modest ash fall, and this has very important lessons, I think, in general. The visibility went literally to zero for three days. Road, rail, air transport was impossible for three to five days. And it was only for fortuitous rainfall that <coughs> cleared the air, and without that, these conditions would have just continued. 10,000 people got stranded because there was no communications across the state to warn people of of the impending ash cloud. A state of emergency was declared. All people were compelled to stay at home. Uh, Life-saving emergencies only were addressed. All business schools, government closed until the ash removed. And these people received no outside help, and they had to get on with it themselves uh, without, as I say, any previous planning or experience uh, and knowing, not knowing initially what to do. And in the middle of all this, health was a really major concern of the people surrounded by all this ash and having to breathe it 24 hours a day. <coughs> this uh, fallout did eventually become much less of a problem months later, and there were no further major eruptions, of course. So this map shows the impact of the ash fall in central Washington. Oops. And um, where the ash fell, Kathy has already mentioned something about this. Um, oh, here's a mouse. Um, and initially, this, this uh, all people saw initially was a very d huge dark cloud in the air coming towards them. And the cloud arrived above Yakima a year or an hour or so after the eruption. And in central Washington state, I've lost the mouse. Um, the uh, ash arrived just after lunchtime, and then further away at Spokane uh, in the evening. Communications were pretty poor in those days, so in fact, they didn't pass on the warnings uh, that the ash was crossing the state. We set up um, immediately uh, a contact with the local hospitals to find out what was going on in health terms, whether they were being besieged by people with serious health problems uh, or, or not, and uh, to find out, essentially, that this was the only way of, of, of identifying what was going on. So in the end, we had 30 hospitals in a, in a quick surveillance program, which was gradually developed. And um, that was our, our main way of checking on what the health, immediate health impacts of the ash were. Now, this uh, immediately drew comparisons. This uh, um, complete uh, darkness with air pollution 
drew immediate comparisons with the famous smog episode in London in 1952, when again a, a blackout occurred from air pollution due to very stable air conditions, weather conditions. And uh, the response to that was uh, a very rapid and sharp um, uh, increase in the death rate from about 100 a day to 500 a day in central London. And people, again, could hardly get around. You can see a picture there of a London bus creeping along in the darkness. And there was some measurement of the air pollution, and it shows in this simple graph the linking between the increase in air pollution, in this case something called black smoke measure, a very fine particle measure, and with the deaths, total number of deaths a day. So uh, when applying the same sort of eyeball epidemiology to the ashfall, in Yakima, with a population, a town with a population of about 50,000 people, we see a very similar <coughs> correlation between an increase in the air pollution. Sorry, that's my, oh, here we go. This peaking of the air pollution from 80, from 80 um, micrograms per cubic meter for this measurement called total suspended particulate TCP, right up to uh, 40, right up to 34 milligrams per cubic meter during this uh, air pollution episode, which is a huge amount of particulate matter in the air. And this is much coarser material than what they were measuring in London, so you can't make a direct comparison. Um, but you can see a very simple correlation, and the conditions which were, they were reporting to us from Yakima were in the lower graph, which showed um, in exacerbation, exacerbations, really, of pre-existing chest problems to do with asthma and chronic lung problems. But healthy people were basically not affected very much. So this was very important information, and, and, and those two situations, London and Yakima, I believe at the time, I still believe, was telling us something very, very important, that the toxicity to the lungs of uh, ash fallout in this particular eruption was nothing like as comparable to the toxicity of the smog in London, which was due to the air pollution was due to coal burning, uh, fossil fuel burning. <coughs> now, just very quickly to say that that, that American U.S. measure of, uh, of pollution in, in Yakima, total suspended particulates, was looking at very large particles uh, health-wise, up to 100 micrometers in diameter. Uh, but at Mount St. Helens, we were most interested in the particles less than 10 micro microns in diameter, which are capable of entering the lungs. And nowadays, we're very <coughs> It's believed that, in fact, the very fine particles, less than 2.5, is where the main toxicity may lie. Now, when we first kicked off, <laughs> I contacted the USGS, knowing nothing about volcanic ash, and um, I talked to uh, Ray Wilcox, the late Ray Wilcox, who, who reassured me, in a sense, that they knew nothing about these, this very fine fraction of uh, volcanic ash, and that he encouraged me very much to get straight on and investigate uh, this material. And when we did so, we found that, in fact, uh, uh, there was a very large content of particles less than 10 microns, which meant that uh, most of the particles, at least 90%, were capable of entering the lungs. The other thing you need to do when faced with an unknown mineral dust is look for, the crystal, look for crystalline silica and initially, we found the report was that it was 28%, which was very alarming, and I'll explain why in a moment. And that set off alarm amongst the population as well when these initial results were produced. And also, the third thing to check is fibers, like asbestos or asbestiform fibers, and we found none. So the alarm went out that there was a risk potentially of silicosis in the population and nobody knew quite what silicosis was in the general population, but they, they felt this was a very serious disease, and it is. We don't see much of it now in the United States or the UK, uh, with controls in the workplace where most exposure to silica dust goes on. Uh, but in countries like China, for instance, there may be as many as a million cases 
of silicosis reported a year. It's a chronic disease which, uh, can, and the silica dust can set off a progressive scarring of the lungs, which can eventually lead to death and certainly impair life. So uh, it became important that we um, were able to establish what the risk actually was, and um, so further work was done. Now, uh, just to summarize all this, because we don't have time to go into it, I'll just summarize what was found. But generally speaking, we didn't find any, any uh, a large, we, we found only a small number of people with pre-existing hosp uh, lung problems who were affected by the ash. Uh, we, uh, a study of loggers was, was set up in, for the long term and then stopped after four years. And it was agreed that the risk of psychosis in the loggers who were the most exposed to ash in the population was very low. And we also reassured the population as, <coughs> as far as we could that the risk in the population was low, but in any case, the ash was weathered away and people stopped worrying about it eventually. Now, how, can we really generalize these findings from Mount St. Helens to other eruptions? And what is the legacy in being able to either reassure or investigate problems in other similar explosive eruptions. And I don't think we can extrapolate from the conditions people were exposed to in the United States. Uh, we're into countries where there is poverty, poor housing for, to protect people, and, and there may be uh, um, concurrent lung diseases in the population, such as tuberculosis. And the main, the main cause of death in children under five years of age in the developing world is uh, pneumonia and uh, the possibility of the two being concurrent in, in an individual could be fatal and therefore we had a different pop we do have different population bases uh, in, in different countries different states of health finally what these are generalizable ashfall key lessons uh, as I explained, there was no pre-eruption planning, which was, is really essential for ash fall and its impacts. The ash can remain in the air for days until rainfall. Fine ash is impossible to remove until rain falls or water applied, and huge amounts of water are needed for cleanup. Central Washington was an agricultural semi-arid area, and they were very fortunate that there was rainfall after only uh, six days after the eruption. And special cleanup equipment is actually needed, and it's very hard to remove stuff just with shovels. And uh, it's all a very costly process. And in some low, medium income countries, they don't even attempt to spend the money on tasks like that. So the legacy, though, really comes to the fore when we uh, now turn to the eruption of the Super Hills volcano in Montserrat, <coughs> a small island, which is the UK in the Caribbean. It is a um, UK overseas territory, so the UK is responsible for the health and safety of the population on this island. And when the uh, er eruption started, it was very small um, steam coming from the ground in uh, 1995, but then it gradually escalated. And the first explosive event was on the 17th of September. And here we had conditions, unlike Mount St. Helens, where we did in fact find a, an alarmingly high content of crystalline silica in the ash, and also we were set for exposure going on for many years, because this eruption was not just a one-off like Mount St. Helens. So we really had the ideal conditions, if you like, for um, the emergence of a real problem with silicosis. We wouldn't have been alerted to this were it not, had not been the experience of Mount St. Helens. The tendency in all these situations is to call the ash a nuisance dust, it's natural <coughs> mineral dust, and of no consequence. So these investigations may never have been done without Mount St. Helens um, forewarning us. The, uh, it was an, a dome forming eruption with, with the dome growing and collapsing, producing pyroclastic density currents. And uh, early studies, well, studies showed quite a high crystalline silica uh, levels between 15 to 25 weight percent, which is much greater than the 5 to 8 percent at Mount St. Helens. The mineral matrix is very important, and we, after work with Claire and uh, Claire, Claire Hall and David Danby, uh, we realized that this is a very crucial issue in terms of the toxicity of the uh, ash, but we don't understand the factors involved. Oh, time's going on. 
Anyway, exposure was pretty high <coughs> for almost 10 years on and off. And um, we were constantly monitoring the situation. And uh, it got to a point in 1997 when a risk assessment was um, decided upon on whether the island should be evacuated or not. And um, one of the factors to consider was not just the escalation and the volcanic activity, but also the effects of the ash as potentially uh, being, what, what is the hazard, or what is the risk of, of for the population of exposure to, to the ash was also brought to a head. And uh, fortunately, the areas of heavy ash fall um, coincided with the greatest danger from the volcano. So making an exclusion zone there as well as protecting people from immediate death from PDCs, it also actually was a line with, between where the highest dust exposures were occurring and the lowest or the least. We'll cut along now to, we, we actually went, in, well we said in that, we were concerned about areas around the volcano in that risk assessment, that in fact they had a really high probability of developing silicosis, but as I say that was, um, uh, minimized by moving the population out of the exclusion zone. We, we did, a few years later, a probabilistic assessment uh, <coughs> on what we thought would be the risk of silicosis if the eruption went on for 10 to 20 years. And um, we have some rough figures there, which are really quite low probabilities of disease occurring. And that, again, was something quite novel to undertake studies of that sort. Okay, summarizing. We, uh, summarizing, we, we now turn to, so very quickly we'll turn to other eruptions where uh, there was the crystalline circa isn't the problem, but large amounts of ash and fine ash, respirable ash, are a problem. And these eruptions can go on for uh, months, years, uh, rather like uh, the continuing exposure at Montserrat. And in this case, um, more as final slide. Um, our, now, our new concern is PM 2.5, these very fine particles I mentioned before as being very potent, uh, the potent part of the air uh, pollution. And uh, PM 2.5 is now very uh, well known throughout the public as being hazardous and uh, WHO, et cetera, estimate about four million annual deaths occur globally. On the right-hand side of the slide, <coughs> we have the main diseases which are now associated with uh, PM 2.5 exposure. And the point is that in ash, there's a very significant proportion of these very fine particles in all explosive eruptions. And this is now the new hazard we have to face, uh, as well as uh, crystalline silica in explaining the risk of volcanic ash to health. So finally, uh, this uh, eruption in Mount St. Helens really started the whole multidisciplinary uh, and evidence-based approaches to human impacts in volcanic eruptions. And um, uh, that, I think, is the legacy which is continuing to this day. OK, um, we'll hold off any specific questions for Peter at the moment. And I invite all our speakers up to the dais um, so we can uh, have our bit of a panel discussion. So we'll first ask if there are any burning questions out in the audience. And if not, we will start it from up here. So one of the first questions I have is, for each of your disciplines, have we learned all that we have to learn from the 1980 eruption? And you can no. <laughs> go on down. It can be long or short. Yeah, definitely not. <coughs> and um, I, I didn't even touch a subject that I'll talk about this afternoon, which is what we've learned about magmatic processes and continue, it, continue to learn. And uh, I think the most important thing from my perspective about these legacy data sets 
is that if you have a good foundation, then you can continually go back uh, as new models develop, as new analytical techniques develop, uh, and continue to data mine that material. I, I, I think uh, no, and um, that one of the things that has been seen around the world is that the more you monitor, the more you see, and we're still making discoveries today, and uh, there's a, new, new tricks that people will develop down the road, and in some ways, the job of monitoring gets more and more complicated as we see more things that we feel, feel like we need to be able to measure so that we can track things better. I too would say no. And I would also argue that at least when you're talking about landscape recovery, it's still ongoing. And so the experiment in that sense is still in action. Well, guess what? <laughs> <laughs> of course not. <laughs> um, the ecological systems at Mount St. Helens, um, when you think of them, you think of the early successional species being Douglas fir, which live for a thousand years. So it's going to be a thousand years before these early successional species are just growing. And then we have the longer term species, the noble firs, the western red cedar. So it is a phenomenal experience. And I hope that we can keep um, studying this place so that we can learn more about other things and then learn how to manage um, the disturbances that we are creating. Thanks. Um, no, we are really in a problem with uh, volcanoes and health and, and the, the effects of volcanic ash because it's <coughs> the eruptions occur in countries low mid, medium income where they don't have anything like the facilities for studies the United States or the UK has and so it's a real dearth of d data in terms of what is the actual risk of exposure to volcanic ash and I can't see, like for example, we haven't come across yet a case of silicosis we can identify being caused by a volcano. And to show the effects of PM 2.5 would require very, uh, uh, epidemiological studies of very large populations. Well, there's only 4,000 people in the end who are on Montserrat, and it's an unstable population as well. So um, I'm a bit depressed about what we can do about, uh, in terms of getting really hard data on health effects, but it's going to be a very long process, and perhaps we'll always in a state of having to uh, caution and use precautionary principle in these heavy ashfall episodes, even though we don't have enough data to fully justify it. So from uh, your various perspectives, um, for you, what was the biggest surprise of the eruption or the aftermath? <laughs> if there was. <laughs> That it happened. <laughs> the, 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 you know, the, the, that it happened and then it happened with no warning in the short term. And one of the things that happened in the aftermath for scientists was that there had been optimism that there would be some warning and that uh, colleagues like David Johnston would uh, have, have been given some shot at getting out before something happened. And the fact that that didn't happen was, was, was devastating. Now, uh, not you know, personally as well as scientifically. Well, I would say how diverse its impact was because, um, you know, I was taught a disturbance is an event and then you look at the recovery from it. But what we've learned is that this disturbance was so complex and therefore the recovery was extremely complex. And that phenomena is true when we look at fires, when, when we look at road establishment, when we look at dam removals, everything is more complex than we thought. Um, I think uh, for me, the, the uh, most impressive thing and also the shock was the natural blast as far as human impact is concerned. Chris Newell came up, came up with a sentence of what if in the area the trees had been humans and the volcano wasn't in a forested wilderness, but it was actually near a, a high population center. And that's, to me, from a human point of view, has been one of the, one of the most important drivers for me to, uh, to investigate further. Yeah, certainly, uh, I think the, the lateral blast from a volcanology point of view was the biggest surprise. 
Uh, I didn't get to Mount St. Helens until December of 1980. And I remember even though I'd seen numerous pictures and newspaper articles, uh, when I first got to the mountain and saw the actual scale uh, of the lateral blast, it, it was really breathtaking. And I think in, to follow up on the first question that Cynthia asked, um, I think we still haven't really taken into account uh, this, this lateral motion and the very wide source of that initial uh, coignum bright plume. And also, uh, Rick Hoblet's insight that the, the high elevation that it achieved uh, was because it was acting like this big, he called it a dirty thunderstorm. Uh, and so the, the realization that these plumes are not only driven from the volcano itself, but then have internal dynamics that continue to make them evolve. Question from the audience. This is a question from either Kathy or Seth, I guess. What, what, what is it about the magnetic system that uh, leads to a lateral uh, explosion like happened with Mount St. Helens versus a, more of a, a, what you think is a, a conventional sort of summit eruption? Uh, just real quick, I'll repeat the question for our online <laughs> audience. And the question was, what is it about the Mount St. Helens magnetic system that would maybe kind of predispose it to more of a lateral type event versus your typical Plinian vertical event? Um, I'll just, I'll give one answer and then I'll hand it over to Seth. I think it's, it's interesting, there, there are volcanoes that mostly produce lava domes and there are other volcanoes that mostly produce explosive eruptions and there are all sorts of reasons that might occur from the magmatic system. Mount St. Helens is primarily or has been primarily a dome producing um, volcano and I think that in this case, uh, there was a, a dome at the summit from the previous round of activity, and particularly uh, in comparison with what happened in 2004, which was similar, I think the magma <coughs> was rising up and it was just easier for it to do a sideways than to try to push that summit dome out of the way. Um, John Blendy and I have actually been discussing uh, potentially the even the role of hydrostatic head, uh, which is, depends on the, the level that magma is stored and what sort of force it has to go up and um, whether their individual volcanoes reach heights that are related to their conditions of magma storage that then uh, if it's reached that height, then it's gonna go sideways rather than up again. So the thing that made the lateral blast happen was the landslide and the instantaneous removal of pressure. And one of the things that um, we've learned, I think, about St. Helens is that there may have been something structural about the, the cone, as, as Kathy was saying, um, that predisposed the north flank to be, to be weaker. And that really underlines the importance of having an understanding of volcanoes, uh, uh, the, the structure of the edifice itself for hazards uh, pronouncements down the road, hazards assessments, and that you can't just be sort of a, with distance, it's a, it's a simple with distance to the, the, the hazard is this, um, and that there needs to be an understanding enough of the volcano itself so that you understand that there's, you know, um, like at Mount Hood, um, there's an understanding that the south side is more vulnerable than the north side because of the geometry of the cone. And um, the, yeah, but, the landslide was what made that, that happen. And so anytime in the future, if you see something like that at the volcano, that's gotta be one of the things you're thinking about. Any other question from the audience? Gordon. So the question is, the question for the audience is, uh, at uh, AGU in the future when we are celebrating the 200th anniversary, um, you know, what confidence do we have that we might be able to have predicted the, uh, the trajectories of both the eruption and the responses uh, in these re respective fields? Uh, not much confidence at all. <laughs> given, uh, you know, I feel like an old folk now. Uh, but given the changes that I've seen in volcanology over the last 40 years, again, as we've gone through primarily changes in technology, which have driven changes in uh, models and con conceptual models and ideas about how volcanoes work, uh, I have 
I have no way of foreseeing what the next hundred years will show us. <laughs> Ditto. And in, in volcanology and volcano geophysics, we're fundamentally data poor and have not observed many of these eruptions, both from an eyewitness perspective, from a geologic perspective, and from a, a monitoring perspective. And um, there's all kinds of surprises that are out there in store. We've seen them at St. Helens, we've seen them at other volcanoes. And it's actually, I'd love to be here for the 200th anniversary just to see what's been learned. So I'm gonna state it a little bit differently. I hope that in the next 100 years, we have a better understanding of how to predict the timeline associated with um, sort of high sediment yield events. And I feel like we are making progress in that, not so much by just studying Mount St. Helens, but by studying um, dam removals on the Elwha River, by studying large landslide deposits, by studying dam removals in Oregon. So I feel like we're, we're building up a mass of case studies, and I would hope that in 100 years we'll be able to kind of plunk you know, like the North Fork Toodle River into that and see if it fits within the spectrum of what was expected. So that's a great question. And I'm also going to be very positive. Um, I showed you the figure of successional understanding that was pretty simplistic before Mount St. Helens. And that was largely built on what ecologists called old field studies. Ecologists had gone literally into old agricultural fields that had been abandoned and looked at what happened. And that's just not typical of the kind of disturbances that occur both from natural events and from human caused events. And so the figure with the red that showed all of what we learned, um, I think that learning has been valuable and will help us in the future. But what's important is that that kind of knowledge be put in the textbooks. And so I am constantly pulling out you know, introductory ecology textbooks and looking at how they're explaining disturbances and succession. And not all of them are as advanced as I'd like to be. And then I write to the authors and <laughs> try, to, try to improve things. But I think we need to make sure that the learning that we have is not just in these high-level journals that we create, but also goes um, to freshman bi biology classes, in my cl case, and also to younger um, audiences. I'm always looking at the books on volcanoes and other types of disturbances that kids are learning, and we need to um, make sure those are updated across all our fields. You want to say anything? Okay, thanks. thanks. Um, I think since Mount St. Helens, we've only got a very small window of uh, eruptions to, as Seth said, I think, to, um, to start to draw any conclusions. And from a health point of view, we really only have a couple of data points on the graph at the moment, and we need to have much more experience of eruptions of different types. Yeah, well, we're kind of at our limit, but I'm going to pose one more quick question. It's a little bit of a follow-up to some, what Virginia just said and, and a comment that Kathy made earlier, and, and the comment was, you know, for many of us up here at the table and in this room, I mean, Mount St. Helens has been a pivotal event in our careers. Um, but I'll, I'll go half of what Gordon said. When, when, at Mount St. Helens 100, um, will Mount St. Helens still matter? And, you know, will it just be a distant memory or will it still have significant impact on the field? I'll jump in here really quick. I think absolutely it will matter. It's a case unlike anything else that we've seen so far. And I will be honest, I was in kindergarten when Mount St. Helens erupted. And yet it's had a very important impact on my career and the way that I think about landscape recovery. So I think there are so many lessons to be learned. I don't think it will ever be irre irrelevant. Yeah, and I'll give a different type of, of answer. Um, another long-term interest of mine has been in the role of stories. And uh, when I was teaching for years at the University of Oregon, when I first started teaching, my students would say things like, Mount St. Helens ruined my fifth birthday party. And then very quickly, <laughs> they hadn't been born. And yet, in talking to them, uh, I could tell who was from the area and what area, I mean, what part of the Northwest they were from, just based on family stories. Uh, so whether the stories were about the Lahars or hearing the boom or having the ash fall. And uh, more and more, I think, in this day and age, actually these, these family stories are critical. And certainly in the Northwest, uh, you both know that when you introduce yourself as a volcanologist, um, everyone has a story about Mount St. Helens. And it's, it's one of those pivotal events 
uh, for the region that I think will persist. So I want to add to that, um, my granddaughter's first grade class was doing a project on volcanoes in Washington, D.C. area. So it's not just in the Pacific Northwest. And all the kids made volcanoes, and I came in, and guess what I brought them? A volcano cake. And I gave a talk, and my granddaughter wants to be a volcanologist when she grows up. Um, and I think this occurs not just in the Pacific Northwest, but I think disturbances are more common as people talk about climate change. They're trying to figure out what that means. That's a global disturbance. I think it is something that is taught in schools from first grade on now, and um, all of the diversity of fields that we've been talking about, I think, should be included. It isn't always. Volcanology is more exciting. <laughs> Sorry. And. Um, I think the question, John, you, you ask is, uh, I found myself feeling sad at first, um, <laughs> that the, uh, it's got to matter. And in our neck of the woods at, at the Cascades Volcano Observatory, um, our ability to tell the story and to keep it fresh in the Cascades is, I think, the way that we're going to keep the understanding of volcano hazards and the interest in society on understanding hazards and mitigating them. Um, if we're not successful in having people care about Mount St. Helens 60 years from now, then there's going to be some other problems we're going to be facing as well. And that's the real challenge for the next generation of scientists. We're, uh, a lot of the people that were working in 1980 are either on the verge of retiring or have retired. And the next generation, it's our job to keep that story alive. I think what will stay in the textbooks for 100 years, unless there are a few bigger eruptions uh, than Mount St. Helens in the meantime, is uh, that lateral blast, as Kathy mentioned. And I've been up in the air over Mount St. Helens twice over the years. And looking across that colossal area of devastation, it will forever be in, talked about and discussed. Well, great. This is a discussion I'm sure we could keep going for quite some time. But sadly, um, our session time has expired. So I want to give a, a real round of applause to our speakers. And I want to thank our. Uh, our audience, and I'd like to thank Claire and Cynthia for co-convening the session with me. So thanks for attending. We hope you found it informative. <laughs>